As a rooted deeply and forward-looking community, we hope that you will be blessed by this message. For more information, visit rechurchza.com. It's been a while since, since I last visited, visited you. He's Paul, yeah, I saw his... Where's, Where's Paul? More than, More than a, year. a year ago, Paul? Yeah. yeah. In any case, I want, I want to preach to you out of, out of the book, book of Judges, Judges this morning. Out of, out of the book, book of Judges. Judges. Now, now there's a pattern of behavior in the book of Judges. Book of Judges. The pattern, the pattern is very clear. The people rebelled through, through idolatry and, and disbelief. Then, then God brought judgment through, through foreign oppression. oppression. And, and then, then when, when these people were in oppression and, and it went tough, tough with them, God raised up a deliverer or a, or a judge, so to say, and uh, the, people the people repented. They turned, they turned back, back to, Lord, to, God. to God, and when they did that, the Lord delivered them. Now, in, in the context of the book of Judges, he delivered them with a judge, a person that he raised up. And then they fell back into idolatry and disbelief and in disobedience, and the cycle started again. And this carried on for between 300 and 400 years, if you just isolate the, the, the time of the Judges. So uh, it's really a sad story to think that you have to go through a cycle and again and again and again and again. If you read the book of Judges, you'll find 12 designated judges. It's a little bit more than 12, but in any case, there's 12 designated judges in that book. Um, then the one guy is not designated a judge, but he, he operated as a judge, so, but that's not important. Um, Jewish tradition tells us that Samuel wrote the book of Judges. And uh, there's, a, there's a huge gap between the opinion of the people how long this period lasted. Most people in agreement that it's about 300 years, but it could be up to 400 years. Reason being that some of the judges, the period of them, some of them might have overlapped. Um, but I think there's something important to just to bear in mind when you look at this space of time in the history of the nation of Israel is that I always seem to think in my mind that so the nation sinned as a collective and they turned their back on God, they served as foreign gods and God equipped one of the foreign nations to oppress them um, and, and, and only that is part of the cycle. But in this period, there was really little unity amongst the 12 tribes. So if you just think about it, they came out as a nation, 12 tribes out of e Egypt, and Moses led them. And, and in this united leader, uh, there was more unity than when they separated. Now, after Moses, Joshua came, he died at the age of 110, and they conquered land, and now it was time for these tribes to take up the inheritance. And I think it's, it's very important for us to think of it, because there's a time for us to take up our inheritance. And the way we do it is very important, how we take up our inheritance. But now all of a sudden, even if they, if they, even if they operated as separate tribes under one leader, now the distance is farther. Um, these guys are now all over the land of Canaan and they inherited their inheritance. And there wasn't, there was less unity. That's the point I, want, I wanted to make to you. If, it's not said as such, but one just can see there's less unity. Just think about it, whenever they fought under a judge against the oppressors, never, not once, were more than six of the tribes united in these battles. Never. And in this 300 years, they fought each other. They fought each other. They went to the, to the extent that they almost destroyed entirely the two nations of, Be the, the two tribes of Benjamin and Manasseh. And yet, out of the, the, the 12 uh, judges, three of them were of the tribe of Manasseh. 
and they almost destroyed these two tribes. So there was really no unity. And in, in this book, you see this pattern. And I kind of draw a parallel then between Israel and the church. I see parallels. I see that um, the church is re really as a whole, at the greater church. I mean, it is lovely to come to one congregation on a Sunday morning like this and experience your love and experience your unity and your love for each other. But as a whole, the church is divided, really. So in our congregation back there in Royal Park, <coughs> one of the members came up with the initiative that we have to do a 40 days fast leading up to Easter and we said, yes, let's do it. And this guy did it, did a great job in any case. And he said, you don't have to fast food only if there's anything else in your life that you think you can set aside, do this. And I said, okay, I like television a lot. <laughs> um, and I said, okay, um, I'll fast television for 40 days. So one of the elders there, in our congregation, he phoned me, he says, I know you're fasting television, but switch on your television on the faith channel. There's something you have to look at. It's very important. You have to look at this. So I, I switched on the television and it was um, some of the, the big churches, independent churches, really upset with the government for providing these restrictions of, of 50 and 100, and, and you know the whole story about COVID, and these guys were really up in arms. And I was taken up in this conversation, and I realized um, the church is not in unity. I really, I really realized, as these tribes in the time of the judges couldn't work together, couldn't serve one God, didn't have one leader as such, uh, uniting them in like Moses did. I realized that the church is, as a whole is in a terrible state and I got really upset because these famous preachers, and they are really famous, um, huge churches, 20 and 30, 40,000 members and what have you, they stood up and they said, this can't go on like this. We cannot function. The church is is in a, in, a, in a difficult position and we cannot function with 250 people. Uh, we cannot open our doors for 250 people. No, it's a long story, but in any case, what I'm trying to get as I said to myself, should I show unity? My church is small, so we can get along with 100 people, the permission of 100 people in the service or 200, 250 people in service. We can get along. But these huge and big churches, they can't open their doors. And I've, I, in my spirit, I just felt, what should I do? Should I come in unity with my brothers or not? Um, uh, and I really got upset, really terribly upset in my spirit because these guys, they challenged openly the president of the country and the laws of the country and just said, you can do what you like, Mr. President, but we will open our doors over Easter. And I understand where they're coming from. There's no criticism. Please just don't hear things that I'm not saying. Don't read between the lines. I said to myself, so we can get along as a smaller community, but our bigger churches can't, can't function in this, in this time. And Shouldn't we be united? This division in the church is, is, is a problem. And I, and I thought about the, the approach of, of the denomination of, under which I serve. And I, I really got upset because we are not in unity. And uh, people are sitting in the head office and they're making rules and they're sending out letters to us and telling us what to do and how to influence our congregations. And I said, but we're in a disagreement. We, we're not in unity. The church is in a, in a terrible state. And I realized something. I realized that if I, if I open my doors and I accommodate, I fill the house and the, the authorities come in there and they arrest me and they take me to jail. Oh, 
It's now, now becoming a serious issue. Am I prepared for that? Uh, and will the brethren whom I in my mind support then come and support me? And to take it one step further, if I just take my own congregation, we are not on the same wavelength when it comes to these things. Some guys reckon you should not hold church at all. You're careless and you're reckless because you put your people at risk. And some other people say, this is nonsense, fill the church. And it's a simple matter. And we can't have unity. And the people of the judges couldn't work together. So I don't think I'm able to convey to you how upset I got in my spirit. I was becoming nauseous. That's how upset my spirit in me got. So for me, Carl, it was a serious matter, regardless of, of, of how it's perceived by the, the rest of, 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 of South Africa. Let me read to you out of Judges 2, a couple of verses. Uh, in the 11th verse, it says, They did many things that the Lord had expressly forbidden, including the worshiping of even gods. They abandoned Jehovah, the God, um, the, uh, the God loved and worshiped by their ancestors, the God who had brought them out of Egypt. Instead, they were worshiping and bowing, bowing low before the idols of the neighboring nations. So the anger of the Lord flamed out against all Israel. He left them to the mercy of their enemies. For they had departed from Jehovah and worshiping Baal and the Asherah's idols. So now when the nation of Israel went out to battle against its enemies, the Lord blocked their path. He had warned them about this and in fact have vowed that he would do it. But when the people were in, uh, but when the people were in terrible plight, the Lord raised up judges to save them from their enemies. Yet even when Israel went, would not listen to the judges, but broke faith with Jehovah by worshiping other gods instead, how quickly they turned away from the true faith of their ancestors, for they refused to obey God's commandments. He just rescued the people of Israel um, from their enemies throughout his lifetime, for the Lord has moved to pity uh, by the groaning of his people under their crushing oppressors, so he helped them as long as that judge lived. So, um, and this basically sums up the book of Judges. It really sums up the book of Judges in, in, in chapter 2. So, we must move back a little bit. Joshua died. They had to take up the inheritance. And they were instructed how to take up the inheritance. There was a, a clear instructions. When you, when you go into this land, don't leave some of the inhabitants there, destroy them, take them out. You've got to clear the land properly. You've got to get the land in a condition where there's no influence of these foreigners with their foreign gods on you. Um, and so the first guy that went into battle was, uh, was Judah. We read in, um, in, in chapter 2, verse 6, and when Joshua had left the people, um, the, 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 uh, let the people go. The children of Israel went every man unto his inheritance to possess the land. Now, after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall go up for us against the Canaanites first to fight against them? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have delivered the land in his hand. So he's got a promise. Judas got to first take up his inheritance and then the rest of the guys will follow. I guess 
that what they should have done is consult the Lord as they go, who should go next and who should go next. Should sometimes we go together or not? In any case, Judah didn't go alone. He had his brother uh, Simeon, and Judah said unto his brother Simeon, come up to, to me, uh, up with me unto my lot. And that's this piece of land which the Lord has said Judah can have. They, uh, that we may fight against the Canaanites. And I like, like, likewise will go with thee unto thy lot. So Simeon went up with him. Now, I think it's great that brothers can work together. But this was really not needed because the Lord has given them a promise that he's going with them and he will give them their inheritance. Um, but regardless, these two brothers, they, they, they worked well together at that time. They went up and they conquered the land. And then something happened. And Judah went up and the Lord delivered the Canaanites and the Perizzites in, in, in their hand. And they slew them at Bezek, 10,000 men. So they went in, they, they fought the battle and they won the battle. But they didn't finish the job. I think that's very important that we just recognize this from Scripture. They didn't finish a job. And then uh, I'll cut the story short because you'll pick up the pattern when you read this book. Then the other tribes went in to take up their lots, take up their inheritance. And I'll give you just a couple of verses. And the children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jeshubites. So they went up and they didn't, they, they conquered the land, but they didn't drive them out entirely. So didn't Joseph and the house of Joseph. They also went up against Bethel. Neither did Manasseh drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shean and her towns. Neither did Ephraim drive, and these are all verses in, 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 in Judges. Neither did Ephraim drive out the, the Canaanites to dwell in Gezer. Neither did Zebulun drive out the inhabitants of Kitron. Neither did Asher drive out the inheritants of Echo. So there's a pattern. Neither did Naphtali drive out the inheritance of this Beth Shemesh. So we're going up to take up our inheritance, but we only do it partially. And that, is, that was contrary to the instructions of God. And it's not that God wanted just to kill people for the sake of killing him, but those people, their existence in the land among the tribes caused all the problems. The pattern that follows here is because of that. Because now our neighbors is Canaanites. Our neighbors are people that's not serving the same God we are serving. We are not, we, there's, different in, 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 there's different gods in this piece of land. And so the Israelites, they look at these guys and they look at their gods and they, and this caused them to fall into rebellion against their God, the God that brought them out of Egypt. It was these, um, um, sorry, I'm going to use this Afrikaans word, Boomstamme. They had these tree, trees that they worshipped and they had all these images, idols, that the images that they, that they worshipped. And so the guys that they were supposed to destroy take them out of the land, take out all these out of, out of the land, which they didn't, they, they partially did it. So they only partially took up the inheritance. That caused them the problems later on. Because now they're living amongst these people and their children see that these people's, uh, 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 the son sees that these daughters of these Canaanites are beautiful and they take them as their, as their wives. And the daughter sees that these Canaanite men are handsome and they take them as their husbands. And there's an integration with these foreign nations. And they serve different gods. They bow to different gods. And because of this, there becomes a distance between the Israelites, that tribe, and God. And that is a big, big problem. Even in the church today, it's a problem. Just think about this for a moment. I, I really want you just to consider this for a moment. Are you always on fire for the Lord? 
Don't raise your hands, please. Are you always obedient to the Holy Spirit? Why not? Why is it that we feel that we get into a service and the anointing of the Lord is there and we have a nice worship service and the worship teacher, team leads us right into the presence of God and we say, well, we can say like David says, we can take on the world. We can take on the enemy. And then we leave. And tonight is fine. We are on fire. But tomorrow morning at work, we get into a situation and by Tuesday morning, I feel there's a distance. The gap between me and the Lord has opened up. Do you experience things like that? Am I crazy? Is it only me that sometimes experiences these things? So now all of a sudden, a gap forming up. Because on Tuesday morning, I was so much in a hurry. I couldn't dedicate my time to the Lord that morning. I, I had an early morning meeting and I, you know how life happens. Doesn't it take you in? And then by Wednesday morning, I feel distant from God. I lost my cool in a meeting or something happened. And all of a sudden I feel, oh, I'm such a terrible Christian. And that's exactly where the enemy wants me. He wants me to feel guilt because that guilt then forces a wedge between me and my Savior, Jesus Christ. It forces a wedge between me. So that we can look at these judges and say, how stupid can humankind be to follow these things for 300 years? How stupid can we be? Human beings, the very God that saved me from depression and bipolar, the very God that really touched me. How can I not remember what the Lord has done from Sunday to Tuesday? So I think write that word remembrance on a piece of paper and stick it in your cars and stick it on the fridge. And when you see it, you remember what the Lord has done for you, how he saved you from the enemies, from the Midianites with only 300 men. How he opened up the sea for you to walk on dry ground. How he saved you. Every time, every time he saves you, we just call on the Lord and say, Lord, I need you. So when you read Judges, you will find two things. You'll see that man is very deceivable. It is so easy to deceive man. That is part of our nature. We are deceivable. And read the scriptures. He said the heart of man is deceivable. The wisest man on the face of the earth. Solomon said it in Proverbs. Our heart can deceive us. My own heart can deceive me. So how did these people that walked on dry land between the sea, how can he go and fall on his knees between a day on a, in front of a dead tree? He forgot. He forgot. He did not remember what the Lord has done. He forgets. And then he mingles with these foreign gods. And they influence him. And they deceive him. And he thinks, oh, this is a better way. Look at the prosperity of the world. Look how they prosper. Look how they function. Look, look. And I can, oh, I can carry on. Let me not carry on, Carl. You got the message. Man is deceivable. But God is good. God is good every time these deceived human beings parted their ways from their God who really delivered them from their bondage, from their shackles, who healed them, who kept them. Every time 
when they look at the other gods, they get deceived and they part from God. And they follow this God and it leads them into calamity time after time after time. Calamity for them. And then they cry and say, it's terrible. Lord, where are you? And he says, I'm right here. I'm ready to help you. Ah, what a God we serve. Character. God's character is so in love with you guys. I want you to hear it. I want you to hear it. I want you to open your spiritual ears this morning and hear how he shouts out, Yes, I love you. I love you. I love you guys. Bill, I love you. Hear how he shouts it. Hear how Jesus shouts it. I love you. Francis, I love you. My grandson is sick, but he loves me. He's a kind God. We find ourselves being deceived week after week after week. We cannot get unity amongst the children of God, every church to himself. When are we going to get it together? When will the church start working together? When, they real, when will they realize that we're not each other's enemy? The tribes fought each other. They're trying to destroy each other. When will we stand up and be not deceived? When? Guys, when we remember. So my advice to you this morning is take your name, remembrance, to heart. Take your name, remembrance, to heart and say, oh, I can remember what the Lord has done. And that will put you on another trajectory. Who can remember what the Lord has done for you? Who can remember? Can you remember? You should never forget that. Can you remember? I was saved more than 40 years ago. How many times have I told my testimony in the last 10 years? I didn't, because I think it's old. But it's something to remember, guys. It's something to realize how good the God is that I serve and how much he loves me and how much he cares for me. Listen, guys, people are not your enemies. There is an enemy there out there, and he wants to deceive you. And he wants to lead you astray from this God who loves you. And then we fall into calamity. And there's a pattern. And I've said enough. May the Lord really bless you. <coughs> May the Lord really bless you. May this church grow from strength to strength. May you increase in size, but you will, may you also increase in your love for this God who loves you so much that he gave his life. And as he said, we're so desensitized, am I using the correct word, for what he's done on the cross. It's not kind of, we only remember it on his Easter. Only remember it on Easter. No, guys, let's not be forgetful. Let us remember what the Lord has done every day of our life because make it out to yourself, just, just, just don't think you're above it. Don't think that you are not deceivable. Mankind is deceivable. I am deceivable. It's easy to deceive me. And so are you because that's the nature of humankind. Read the Bible. See how many times they were deceived. Regardless, God is good. He's always good. He's only good. The calamities is not caused by God. Calamities are not caused by God. He loves you. Hear your name. Carl, I love you. Hear your name. I love you, boy. You're mine. You're my son. I love you. Hear it. Hear it. And let's, let's take care of each other. Guys, we need to function as a body. When you see I'm deceived, you've got to help me. 
Could I help each other? Unity is vital. Unity is vital. It's really important. Let us pray together. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that we can read your scriptures, Lord. And in the scriptures, we realize that you are good and that you are extremely good, that you are loving and that your love cannot be compared to anything else that we can ever compare it to. And that you really gave your life for us, Lord. You care for us. You love us, Lord, even if we're deceivable, even if we distance ourselves from you and we bow before foreign gods. When we call out your name, you always come to our rescue, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for your kindness. I read, Lord, in Romans that it is that kindness that leads me to repentance. And Lord, I want to repent today that we are deceivable. And we ask you in the form of your Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, I ask that you will help us, that you will enlighten us, that we will just know that the Lord is good and never doubt you, Lord. Never doubt you. And help each other, Lord, not to be deceived and to remember, Lord, and to remember what you're doing for us every day, Lord. And testify to your goodness and your kindness and your mercy, Lord. I pray that over this congregation. I pray for the people of remembrance, Lord, that they will never feel on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday that they cannot call upon the name of the Lord. That is your desire, even, Lord, if we were deceived on Wednesday. Call upon your name, Lord. I pray that for this congregation. I pray that you bless them, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you eradicate sin in this congregation. I pray, Lord, that you eradicate disease in this congregation. I pray, Lord, that the people will look to this congregation and say, Wow, the Lord is among them. They have unity. They care for each other. And they know that they're deceivable. Therefore, they remember what you do and what you've done. Thank you, Lord. I worship you. I worship you, Lord. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you. I want you to just pray, pray for, for, be prayful for, for a minute. Are there any person here that needs ministry? Are there any person that needs ministry? You can just raise your hand if you need ministry. I won't call you out. There is a person that needs ministry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So may the Lord just minister to you as you stand there, brother. Holy Spirit, I ask you to personally minister to him. Thank you, Jesus. You minister to him. Thank you. Bless his heart, Lord. Lord, make your love real to him this morning. Make your love real to him, Lord. Let him in the innermost part of his being experience your love, Lord. I pray that in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you very much for the, for the privilege to preach the word of God. I tell you, I think many of you are really more competent than the guys or myself standing on the stand. And uh, thank you for listening. May the Lord really bless you and keep you. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to listen and we hope you've been blessed. For more information, visit readchurchza.com.